Welcome to Natu Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. The Rise of the Chinese People's Communes by Anna Louise Strong, Part 1. There's no Jade Emperor in heaven, no Dragon King on earth. I am the Jade Emperor. I am the Dragon King. I order the three mountains and five peaks. Make way. Here I come. Popular song in 1958. Introduction. Some misconceptions. People's communes swept all China at the end of last summer. By December, they contained over 120 million households, 99% of the peasant population. They became the base on which rests China's immediate future, and the units from which the more distant future is expected to grow. They are discussed abroad by everyone from Secretary Dulles to Marshal Tito, neither of whom has any idea how the people's communes work. I have therefore made preliminary collection of facts from four personal visits to widely scattered communes in Hunan, Jiangsu, Guangdong, and near Beijing, and from interviews separately held with some 50 men and women members of communes from all parts of the country, and from nine months' perusal of commune news. The facts suggest that we have here a new form of social organization, which is widely misrepresented, but which has great significance for China and the world. I leave to the theoreticians the relation of the communes to Marx. The term, quote, commune, end quote, has historically been used with various meanings. The early French use to designate merely a community, the revolutionary use in the, quote, Paris commune, end quote, the many idealistic communal settlements in early America, of which Yano Colony and others were as late as the period after the First World War, and the communes in the USSR's first period of collectivization, which were dropped in the 30s as premature. The people's communes in China differ from all of these. We must define them not by preconceptions, but by the Chinese facts. They are large members of agricultural cooperatives, which at once assume new, wider functions. They handle not only farming, but industry, commerce, education, and military affairs on their territory, which is commonly that of a township or larger. They run the local schools, and some of the local branches of the state bank and state trade. They thus differ from past communes in other parts of the world by the wideness of their powers, which include state power and military affairs. It is not strange that many peasants, in their first enthusiasm over these wide powers, declared that they were, quote, entering communism, end quote, with, quote, each according to his needs, end quote, and even, quote, absorbing the state, end quote. The Chinese Communist Party promptly corrected these enthusiasts and made it clear that communism demands a much higher stage of production than can exist in China for many years. The People's Communes, it stated, should at present pay according to work rather than according to needs. It may thus be seen as the introduction of the quote wage system end quote to a peasantry that has hitherto lived by subsistence farming. However, even at the beginning, this wage system is modified by a certain amount of, quote, free supply, end quote, depending on local decision. Most spectacular of these was the rapid and wide introduction of, quote, free food, end quote, which came as the result of the bumper crop. Other free items, maternity care, free schools and kindergartens, and old people's homes, are less revolutionary, since they also exist in capitalist lands, either as free education or as community relief. In China, however, these free items are based on a new concept. The local people of the township, or of the county, directly own and develop, to the limit of their abilities, all the resources of the area, whether land, water power, timber, or mineral ores, and from this development, look after their community livelihood from cradle to grave. This is not alien to the old Chinese concept of county and village, but is a far greater decentralization of economic and political power than is common today. 
It is expected to promote the rapid growth of production and prosperity in socialist forms under local initiative, and eventually to facilitate the transition to a communist society, in which the people's communes will remain as basic units. The Chinese people's communes thus differ, economically and politically, from past organizations called communes. As I write, in March 1959, they have been in existence for half a year, the first constitution of a commune having been adopted on August 7, 1958. Each of the 26,000 communes differs from every other, each being tailored to its community. All of them change and develop week by week. It is far too soon to pass final judgment on their future. Why, then, should one write at all about this phenomenon? The answer is that serious misconceptions have appeared abroad about the communes, and are being spread for the purpose of attacking China, and even for the purpose of portraying the Chinese people as lawless and subhuman, creatures who might with clear conscience be atom-bombed from the world in the next Taiwan Straits War. Since there are plenty of facts to prove such attacks baseless, they should be answered at once. The best reply is a description of the communes, as they are of present date. Even in an introduction, one may note the chief charges. These are that communes enslave the individual, break down the family, and militarize the people under the militia, spoken of as, quote, Beijing's cops, end quote. Even on present facts, one can show that these charges are ridiculous. The process of industrialization does indeed change the individual's relation to society and to the family. This has happened in every land thus far industrialized. But the changes made thus far by the Chinese communes seem less of a strain on either the individual or the family than by any industrialization in history. The much-advertised, quote, destruction of the patriarchal family, end quote, which the people's communes proclaim, has not yet, in the communes I have seen, removed the grandparents or the children from the homes of the married couples. Long ago, this, quote, destruction, end quote, happened in America, where the young couple usually abandons both parental homes on the day of their marriage. In China, the, quote, big family, end quote, still lives together, not only in the ancient village houses, but in the new blueprints for housing thus far approved by people's communes, all of which include rooms for grandparents as well as minor children. The, quote, homes of respect for the aged, end quote, are for those who have neither sons nor daughters to care for them. They do not, thus far, cater to the aged to have sons. Two changes have been made by the communes which destroy the patriarchal rule. The first is that wages for work are paid to the actual man or woman worker, and not, as heretofore, to the head of the household. The old man, who ruled the home by collecting his son's and daughter-in-law's wages, loses this power. The second change is the establishment of a wide net of public dining rooms, nurseries, and kindergartens, which, quote, liberate, end quote, the able-bodied young housewife from domestic labor, and enable her to earn wages on equality with her man. For women who formerly did both field work and household chores, including the grinding of the grain daily, this is a very welcome liberation. In any case, the parents themselves decide whether they wish to use the local nursery or kindergarten. Thus far, I have not yet found in China even that form of coercion which every small town in America uses ruthlessly, the truant officer compelling attendance at the primary school. What the West calls compulsory school attendance, enforced regardless of the will of the parents, may later develop also in China. But as of early 1959, even in matters of primary schools, the parents still decide. As for the, quote, slavery of the individual, end quote, through industrial routine, let us recall how the westward drive of the United States was bought by two generations of migratory workers, quote, bindle stiffs, end quote, deprived of all normal home life. Let us recall the rug factories of Beijing a generation ago, or the textile factories in Japan, not to mention early Britain, where men and women workers slept in long rows on floors, deprived by years of contract labor of any home. That, if you like, was slavery, degrading the individual. In China, the people's communes avoid all of this. People stay in their village homes, or build better homes in more convenient places in the same township. Meantime, they make arrangements, whereby able-bodied men and women cultivate the fields, develop local industry and trade, 
while the strongest go on temporary assignment to build roads or irrigation projects for their own community use. What slavery is here? As for, quote, militarization, end quote, through the, quote, militia, end quote, here I note only that most peasants I have met welcome the bugle or bell that enables field gangs to assemble on time, in communities which still have few clocks, and like to plant flags in the fields to mark gains in production. Most peasants are also proud that their democratically elected people's commune has its own, quote, home guards, end quote, directly responsible to the commune and not thus far under any Ministry of Defense in Beijing. The need of such home guards was recently emphasized by the flare-up of war in the Taiwan Straits, and is kept in mind by the occasional capture of agents of Chiang Kai-shek, sometimes in the act of planting bombs in schools or theaters. The political significance is hardly that of, quote, militarization by Beijing, end quote, but rather that of the rather amazing trust placed by the central government in a China so short a time removed from the warlord period in locally chosen and locally responsible home guards. The basic fact that needs from the start to be stressed is the extent of the Chinese people's own initiative in the organizing of the people's communes. As Dr. Joseph Needham, the eminent authority on China and Chinese science, recently stated in the New Statesman and Nation, quote, The West cherishes the idea that the population is dragooned to perform its tasks. On the contrary, everywhere one sees spontaneity, often outrunning government planning, a new type of social engineering, the product of leadership from within, not from above, end quote. Those words should be read often. They are a clear, incisive description of the forces operating in today's China. To illustrate them, we'll take the entire booklet. Let us note here, however, that the people's communes arose in China as a mass movement in the rural areas, in which local conditions and organization by local communists played a part, that they existed in slightly differing forms in wide areas before Beijing officially took notice, that they acquired their name and clearer formulation during the discussions of Mao Zedong and other leaders with local peasants in the fields, and that the first official resolution by the Central Committee of the Communist Party about the communes was published on August 29, 1958, at a time when 30% of all China's peasants had already joined, while the more complete formulation by the Communist Party came only on December 10, when 99% of the peasants were already members of communes. The peasants, moreover, encouraged by a bumper crop and the belief that hunger was conquered forever, had already widely voted, quote, free food for all members and their families, end quote, a step which no party resolution had foreseen. Nothing in this history indicates, quote, dictation from Beijing, end quote. The facts do, however, indicate a remarkable technique of leadership, which should be studied and understood. To me, as a Western American, what is most impressive is that the people's communes have given China an economic mechanism that incites every township and county to get irrigation, roads, water power, steel, and modern industry by local initiative, as fast as the local people can do the work. At the same time, it enables China as a whole to get highways, irrigation systems, and a vast network of industry, in an incredibly short time by local energy, without building a vast central bureaucracy and without strain on the nation's taxing power. In these respects, it seems to combine the local initiative that built the American Westward Drive with the social planning that built the USSR. No final word can yet be said on the people's communes. So far, the most authoritative word is the resolution of the Chinese Communist Party, passed on December 10, 1958 by its Central Committee. No government decree yet exists. One may be passed by the National Assembly when it meets in April 1959. The final decision will not be made by the Chinese Communist Party or even by the Chinese People's Government. It will be made by the Chinese peasants, in all the length and breadth of China, through their intelligence and work. Locally, the People's Communes have already absorbed the political form of the township. In some places, they have absorbed the county. The statement of this in constitutional law is yet to come. A leading Chinese communist told me, quote, We think the people's commune is good, but it will take 10 years of testing to know its potential. Some communes will fail this winter. Then, they will reorganize better, and we shall all learn from them. Others will succeed brilliantly and inspire the rest, end quote.
This sense that the future is fluid and will be determined not by decrees or fiats, but by trial and error, by wide experimentation of all the people, by the sowing of a hundred flowers, of which some will show strength to reproduce themselves, is the source of the initiative and creative energy so marked in China today. Roots to Roots by Ming Dao Pine trees beside each other have roots that intertwine. Our village by the others merges its bits of land into great fields. Each commune member lets his heart combine with others. One, how the people's communes arose. The common idea of the West, that people's communes came in China by orders from Beijing, is of course sheer myth. No government ever existed that could force such an organization on 650 million people. The description given by the December resolution of the Chinese Communist Party, quote, a new social organization appeared, end quote, is accurate but inadequate. What natural and human forces produced it? In studying this, one also studies the role of communist leadership in China and the nature of the, quote, mass line, end quote, which may be briefly described as, quote, from the people through the leadership to the people, end quote. When 1958 began, most of the 500 million peasants of China were organized in 740,000 agricultural cooperatives with an average membership of 160 families. When the year ended, these had merged into 26,000 people's communes, with an average size of a township or more, and with functions that included not only farming, but industry, commerce, education, and home defense. We must trace the causes of such change. The farming cooperatives were themselves the result of eight or nine years' growth, which began with the land revolution and the policy of, quote, land to the tiller, end quote. This was part of the, quote, liberation, end quote, itself, or followed it almost at once. Mutual aid teams came quickly, for without aid, the poorer peasants, lacking draft animals and implements, could not have worked their new land. These, quote, teams, end quote, were small groups of neighbors who helped each other in farm work, while keeping private property and land, animals and tools. The mutual aid teams grew, with encouragement by communists and aid of state loans, into farming cooperatives, buying animals and better implements for joint use. For a time, in what was known as the, quote, lower stage, end quote, the private ownership of land and many draft animals was recognized by extra payments at harvest. In a few years, however, the co-ops grew into the, quote, higher, end quote, or, quote, socialist, end quote, form, holding land animals, and larger implements as joint property, and dividing the harvest in proportion to labor performed. This change was not made by confiscation, but by the increasing part played by labor in the joint crop, and by buying the members' livestock for the co-op at market prices on the installment plan, a process made possible by state loans. In winter of 1955-56, to 56, a nationwide, quote, socialist upsurge, end quote, swept most remaining mutual aid teams into cooperatives, and raised most of the lower type of co-ops to the socialist type. By winter of 1957-58, to 58, a large proportion of these cooperatives had paid much of the debts incurred in the purchase of their joint property, and had even begun to save, quote, accumulation funds, end quote. They were ready to think of wider advance. The first joint aim, deeply felt by China's peasants, is control of the water supply. For centuries, they have lived at the mercy of rains and rivers, with floods and droughts decreed by the climate and the long-eroded soils. In the eight years after liberation, the national government accomplished many remarkable feats of water conservation, increasing the irrigated area by some 40 million acres, doubling the total irrigated land which the past centuries had achieved. This achievement was still far below the peasants' needs. Quote, to conquer floods and drought forever, end quote, as a popular peasant slogan has it, would clearly take generations if done by the national government, and would cost an unbearable amount in taxes. Moreover, the great state projects had limits. 
Many reservoirs and canals of past dynasties had been silted up by soil draining steadily from eroded hills. The problem began not with the great floods, but with millions of small streams washing down ravines. If the local peasants could retain these, their own farms would profit at once by the locally retained soil and water, and at the same time, this would materially help control the greater floods. By winter of 1957-58, to this was widely understood, not only by experts, but by the peasants. For China's peasants today are literate and avidly study any information that they find of use. Great drives began in many parts of China in winter of 1957-58, to which dwarfed all irrigation work previously done in world history. Of these drives, I mention only two. Henan province was notoriously poor and subject to famine. It suffered for centuries the floods of the Yellow River, and these were often followed by drought when waters fell. Quote, ten seasons, nine calamities, end quote, said the local proverb. When I visited Hunan in October 1958, they gave me figures. The province had inherited from past centuries some 1,266,670 irrigated acres. In seven years, the national government, aided by the local people, built projects that irrigated 4,500,000 acres more. Then, in the winter of 1957-58, to the local farmers organized, quote, to banish flood and drought forever, end quote. Millions turned out and built reservoirs, dams, wells, cisterns, ponds of every kind, and stored enough water for 13,750,000 acres, three times what the national government achieved in seven years. The projects were not all well done by the local farmers. Some dams and reservoirs were washed away. Only a small part of the stored water was in completed irrigation systems. It was in ponds and wells from which human labor must still carry it by pails to the fields. This did not worry Hunan farmers. They had the water where they could get it, and within another year or two, they could add the electric pumps to lift it into channels for the fields. With water already stored on their land, they felt secure. Even more spectacular was the achievement in Anhui province, at the joining of the Yangtze and Huai rivers and the Grand Canal. In the years after liberation, the national government built here the Great Huai River Project, a gigantic flood control job which became famous around the world. This relieved the great floods, but left the local problems of lesser floods, drought, and waterlogging, which Anhui shares with much of the North China Plain. The daring peasants proposed to handle this problem by crisscrossing the province with wide canals, which should then be connected with the Yangtze, the Huai, and Yellow Rivers, and the Grand Canal, and furnish irrigation, drainage, water power, and water transport to every township. It was an idea which, starting in Anhui, was within a year to be discussed as a serious plan for the whole North China Plain. In the spring of 1958, the Anhui peasants announced that in the irrigation and water control jobs north of the Huai, they had done a total of 3,900,000,000 cubic meters of earth removal during the previous winter, and that this was, quote, seven times what the government did in the same area in the preceding eight years, end quote, which included the Huai River project. The statisticians then added an even more astounding detail of a type dear to the hearts of the thrifty Chinese. When the national government removed the earth, it cost 364 yuan per thousand cubic meters. But when the local people did it, it cost the state just 2.30 yuan, only one 158th as much. The cost per thousand cubic meters of water stored was 290 yuan when the state did it, but only 1.80 yuan when the peasants did it, just one 160th as much. The state had paid for some bridges, tunnels, arches, tools, and wages of technicians, the local farmers did the rest. Who paid for this incredible achievement? This, of course, is where Mr. Dulles says, quote, forced labor, end quote, and where the Chinese communists say, quote, the peasants' political consciousness, end quote. The peasants tell you it was, quote, improving our own land, end quote. In point of fact, the individuals doing the work were paid, but not by the state, and not, in most cases, in cash. They were paid by local cooperative farms, 
which credited them their work on irrigation as work done for the farm, and hence payable by an increased share in the joint harvest. A tax economist would therefore find that the work was actually paid by a local taxation, assumed by the cooperative farms, because they saw its immediate benefits, because they could easily spare the labor in winter, and because everybody hailed it as the surest way to guarantee the coming harvest. In many other parts of China, great water control projects were begun or completed that winter of 1957-58. to In Gansu, they were bringing the waters of the Tao River over the mountains to irrigate 2.5 million acres of hitherto arid soil. In Guangxi, they were controlling the Longyang. In Hebei, the Haihe. In Xinjiang deserts, they were renovating ancient irrigation systems after centuries of disuse. In Inner Mongolia and other parts of the arid northwest, they declared war against the moving sand dunes of the Gobi, which in slow centuries have been swallowing the settlements of men. In Shanxi, one of the worst eroded areas, where soft lowest soil ran down treeless slopes with a total loss of 300 million tons of soil a year, work began which within a year announced the terracing of 4 million acres of sloping land, and the consequent cutting of erosion by one-third saving to the province 100 million tons of soil per year. No Westerner will find it easy to accept such figures, but it is not wise to discount them. For every Chinese child eagerly counts the achievements of his village, and every province checks on other provinces. The Westerner can at least note what may be more important, that everywhere in China appears a great poster, whose design has been copied by hundreds of thousands of local amateur artists on frescoed local walls, as common as Coca-Cola in the USA. It depicts a giant peasant splitting a great cliff and ushering a swift river through, and it bears the words, quote, Let the mountain lower its head, let the river course be moved, end quote. This is the theme of China today. From such actions grew, quote, the military form, end quote. Not by orders from Beijing, but by the fact that when men went out, quote, to conquer a mountain, end quote, it was cheerful and effective to go with drums and banners, and to plant flags on hills showing the extent of their work. Later, Mr. Dulles spoke of it as, quote, the enslavement of the Chinese peasant, end quote, an epithet at which all Chinese angrily laughed. None of these great actions were begun by the Chinese people's communes, but out of them, the people's communes were born. A fascinating motion picture by one of China's many film-producing companies tells a typical story of the birth of a commune. It is called, quote, County Secretary, end quote, and portrays with drama and humor the struggle of 20 small cooperatives in the office of a party secretary for the one modern irrigation pump the county had so far obtained. The chairman of co-op number three, a doughty, one-legged veteran of the Liberation War, wins the pump on merit but loses it through the weakness of the county office to the greedy co-op number 18. Unwilling to start a feud, he suggests that if the other co-ops will help him with the labor to dig a ditch from the Blue Dragon Fall for irrigation, this will be, quote, better than the pump, end quote. The county secretary, inspecting the fall with a technician, finds that the best proposal is a big reservoir, useful on a county scale, but inundating half the land of co-op number 3. Out of this and other dramatic conflicts between local interests and countywide development, the result is clear. All the co-ops form a federation which builds the dam and uses it for everyone's interests. This is a simple, dramatic statement of the actual type of situation from which communes arose. Spontaneous merger of farming co-ops into larger units began in many parts of China in spring of 1958. They took various names, such as, quote, Federation of Cooperatives, end quote, or, quote, Enlarged Cooperative, end quote. Most of them, but not all, came as a result of needs discovered in the irrigation drive of the previous winter. Thus, 48 small co-ops on the Tanshui River in Hunan built 80 small water control projects during the winter, but because of small scale, poor quality, and inability to select the best site, which might be on another's farmland, many of these projects were damaged in the summer flood. When the small co-ops merged, they were able to plant 13 larger reservoirs, which eliminated the menace of flood and drought. All these new mergers, whether they grew from the irrigation drive or from other causes, came because the farming co-ops felt a shortage of labor. 
This is another fact which will seem incredible to the West. Has not China had peasant labor in great excess? But it was a fact that the small co-ops could not deploy labor on the scale needed for all the new activities they wanted. This lack expressed itself in many ways. The Guochuang co-op had iron ore on its land, but lacked coal. The nearby Tianchuang co-op had coal, but no iron. Neither cooperative had funds or labor enough to buy from the other and start the making of iron. When the two merged, it was simple to begin the making of iron and steel by native methods for farm implements. The Sputnik Co-op in Suiping County of Hunan formed in April 1958 by merger of 27 smaller co-ops, in which called itself at first a, quote, enlarged cooperative, end quote, later claimed to have been the first people's commune. There are reasons for this claim, for the Sputnik's new constitution was published and widely copied, and Hunan was indeed a main basis for the first great expansion of communes. But enlarged co-ops appeared also in many other provinces at about the same time as Sputnik. Liaoning, Sichuan, Guangdong provinces all have claims. It may be of interest to note here two other widely differing communes, which began in different manners and which show how varied the new tendency was. A small island off the Zhejiang coast, known as May the First Island, had actually a people's commune, though without the name, as early as 1954. Its total population is 2,700 souls, all fisherfolk. In 1953, they organized four fishing cooperatives. In 1954, these merged into one, thus ending quarrels over the rich but limited fishing grounds. The merger gave funds and manpower enough to launch into deep-sea fishing, the co-op took over the functions of the township's government, which later was the typical mark of a people's commune. It absorbed small handicraft co-ops, a credit and marketing co-op, and a small farming co-op, which grew the locally consumed vegetables. When the movement for communes began, this little island not only took the new name at once, but was ready for a big drive. It set up a fish processing industry, established trade with the mainland, and sent a number of young men to Shanghai to learn to operate motor junks. By December, they had built 18 motor junks and organized two trawlers. Some of the young men already commanded motor vessels at sea. They had also a dozen small factories for motor repair, iron smelting, making fishnets. They had a broadcasting station, a library, a quote, palace of culture, end quote, a school for fishery, a maternity home, electric lights, and telephones. The 1958 gross income was five times that of 1957, a total of 3 million yuan, 1,100 yuan per capita, which is $450 USA. Much of this would at once be reinvested, but all the Fisher families now had bank accounts, while 50 of the poorest had moved into new homes during the year. This amazing advance showed what an already organized community could do on the basis of the new form. The Changshe Commune of Guangdong, which also can claim to be one of the earliest, as it started in April 1958, is interesting for another reason. It grew out of the failure of the co-ops in 1957, and it illustrates the part played by communist leadership in arresting and reversing a failure. This township had some 20,000 people, and there were eight farming cooperatives, none of which were doing very well. The area was mountainous, with thick forests and rich ore deposits, which the peasants exploited spasmodically. The small cooperatives proved unable to handle two kinds of work at once. In 1956, they got a good rice crop, but neglected the side occupations. In 1957, they developed the side occupations, and the grain fell to 219 caddies per mo for the late rice crop. This was partly because the better-off middle peasants, dissatisfied with the income from the cooperative, had taken to private jobs, such as peddling iron ore in Guangzhou, so that entire field gangs were absent from the fields for as long as two months. Members in one cooperative drowned 60 pigs in order to eat them. One township official went in for peddling watches without a license, thus evading the tax laws. In short, the drift towards capitalism, which always exists in a peasant economy, was breaking up the Changshu cooperatives. The contrast of nearby successes with their own failure aroused the local communists in late 1957. 
They reacted by holding a, quote, rectification campaign, end quote, followed by a, quote, great debate, end quote, a process then common in China. A mass meeting of the 800 local communists was first held to criticize and analyze their own errors. This lasted several days. Then, a, quote, great debate, end quote, began for all the peasants on the subject. Quote, which road is best for China, for Changshi, for you personally, capitalism or socialism, end quote. Since communists in their own discussion had already confessed their shortcomings and developed some useful ideas, they were able to show the peasants that the road of individual enterprise, however attractive at first, led to the splitting of the community, the exploitation of some by others, the return of the quote, old society, end quote. The way to cure the lacks of the cooperatives was to combine them, thus gaining enough labor power to organize division of labor. Permanent groups should specialize for each occupation. One-eighth of the total labor force should be permanently assigned to the timber and mines, and keep this work going with the skeleton force even during the height of fieldwork. Then, when fieldwork lessened, large numbers of workers could be thrown into the side occupations under leadership of the permanent staff. Thus, Changshu moved towards modern division of labor. The eight cooperatives merged in April 1958, took over also the local handicraft cooperative, tailor's cooperative, and some transport workers, and were soon given the state-owned marketing establishment. With these changes, and working with the new, united conviction that socialism was the best road for everyone, and that they must make it work, the new combination, later renamed a People's Commune, secured a total income of 13 million yuan in 1958, five times the income of 1957. Of this somewhat more than half came from timber, ore, and newly organized small industries, but the most spectacular progress was in the late rice crop, which had a yield of 1,717 caddies per mo, eight times the yield of 1957. The income per capita is still extremely low by Western standards, it was reckoned at 650 yuan gross income or 400 yuan net income per capita, counting children and dependents. But the commune puts so much back into new investment that its workers will draw only 10 yuan per month, about $4 USA. However, in the past, most of the peasants never drew any wages, and Changshu today offers its members not only wages, but three good meals daily for everyone, children and aged included for which they have not only more rice than they can eat, but also pork, fish, chicken, vegetables, fruits, mushrooms, peanut oil, tea, and honey, all produced by themselves. Quote, salt is the only thing we have to buy, end quote, they boast. One learns from the Changshu commune that, because the leadership of the Communist Party penetrates and connects all areas, no local failure is final, but is discovered analyzed, and made a starting point for its wider success. This was even more strikingly illustrated by Hunan province, which, partly because of mistakes made in 1957, became, in 1958, the leader in the organization of communes. In 1957, there was controversy in Hunan as to whether small cooperatives or larger ones were best. Conservatives in the provincial party committee supported the richer peasants' demand for small cooperatives, and induced a fairly large proportion of Hunan's cooperatives to split into smaller groups. All those which did so found themselves at harvest of 1957 far behind the record of the cooperatives which had persisted in keeping a larger size. The lesson was learned. Hunan peasants at once reversed this trend and promoted wider and wider amalgamation, with confidence born of harsh experience. The winter irrigation drive strengthened this tendency. By April 1958, Hunan, somewhat ahead of other provinces, brought forth the enlarged cooperatives that became people's communes. It is therefore convenient to start the history of the communes with the Sputnik commune in Hunan, even though it began at about the same time as several others. For the Sputnik was the first in Hunan, and Hunan established the trend. It was a trend not only towards larger size, but wider function. The agricultural cooperatives, in merging, took over also local handicraft, marketing, and credit cooperatives, practically all of which served the farms. 
With a greatly increased labor force, a greater discipline was needed. Permanent labor groups were formed, assigned to special tasks or special fields. Having few clocks, they were often called to work by bells or bugles. They set out, quote, to attack the mountain, end quote, with drums and banners, and proudly called this, quote, the military form, end quote, not knowing, and perhaps not caring, how Mr. Dulles would later abuse this term. The tendency to set up nurseries for the convenience of mothers engaged in field work, which had begun in the smaller cooperatives, now widened. These services, which the smaller cooperatives usually charged for, began to be offered free. Public canteens, to save the woman from the heavy drudgery of peasant households and to carry food to the field gangs during harvest, appeared and grew. All these changes began in the small cooperatives and increased in the larger ones. They marked the beginning of a new form. But the peasants were not yet aware of this, nor had the new form yet a name. The new name and the precise definition of function came from Mao Zedong's research and especially from his trips that summer to these new enlarged cooperatives. The Central Committee was of course carefully watching these developments. Mao himself, as well as the other party leaders, spent much time in summer of 1958 traveling to the farms and talking with the peasants and the local leaders. In early August, about the time when Sputnik adopted its constitution as a people's commune, some Shandong peasants, seeking wider organization, proposed that they become a state farm. Mao told them that a state farm was confined to agriculture, and this was not what they wanted. They wanted to absorb not only farming, but local industry and trade. This, he said, was a people's commune, and they should add education and home defense as well. This remark was published in the press. It crystallized action across the country. Dozens of peasants have told me this. All rural China at this time was discussing the enlarged cooperatives and asking in what manner they themselves might gain new strength. Evergreen Commune near Beijing told me that they sent a delegation to study this new form in Hunan. Gansu farm women said that they do not travel far, and why should they? Quote, when Chairman Mao said, quote, people's communes are good, end quote, and that they should include all those things we wanted, we said at once, quote, then why wait, end quote, end quote. A leading communist thus put it to me later, quote, The peasants already knew that they wanted to handle as a unit everything in their locality. They did not have the science to formulate this. The Central Committee had already discussed the future form of expansion, but had reached no decision. Chairman Mao supplied the science and analysis. From his discussions with Shandong and Hunan peasants that summer, the people's communes in their present form were born, end quote. The first publicly announced people's commune was the Sputnik Commune of Hunan, which adopted its new constitution on August 7, 1958. It comprised, at the time, four townships with 9,300 households and 43,000 people. The constitution was published, and the fame of the Sputnik so spread that it recorded 85,000 visitors from all over China in six months. This constitution is therefore historic. The People's Commune in this constitution was declared to be, quote, a basic unit of society, end quote, whose task is, quote, to manage all industrial and agricultural production, trade, cultural and educational work, and political affairs within its own sphere, end quote. Quote, military affairs, end quote, were not listed among essential functions, but Article 10 provided for, quote, a system of citizen soldiery, end quote. The commune took over all members of the merging cooperatives who had reached the age of 16. Members had the right to elect the management, to be elected, to vote on all the commune's affairs. Individual peasants might also join by turning over to common ownership their means of production, except for small domestic animals and small farm tools, which were privately retained. Property turned over to the commune was partly taken as, quote, share capital, end quote, as in the former cooperative, but any excess over a modest, quote, share capital, end quote, was listed as, quote, investment, end quote, to be repaid. All past investments by members of cooperatives, such as livestock and tools, 
turned over at various periods, were also assumed by the commune as debts. The commune took over all collectively owned property and reserve funds of the constituent cooperatives, and also all debts, except for the current funds and debts of the operating year, which the cooperative must complete. The commune's tasks were to develop, quote, an ever-expanding agricultural output, end quote, to build, quote, industry as rapidly as possible, end quote, to build roads, dredge waterways, build modern communications. One item provided, quote, one or two postmen, end quote, for each, quote, production contingent, end quote, a quick way of getting rural free delivery without cost to the state. The commune took over the local branch of the state bank and state trading organs, ran them under regulations fixed by the higher organs, and divided the profits. It absorbed local government, taking over one or more townships. This meant in practice especially the running of local primary and middle schools. The commune thus also became the registrar of marriages. All local resources of nature and man were thus unified and under democratic control. For the highest organization was the, quote, Congress of the Commune, end quote, made up of elected representatives from all production brigades and all sections of the people, such as women's organizations, youth, old people, educational workers, personnel of industrial enterprises. This Congress, elected on a functional basis, then elected a, quote, management committee, end quote, and a, quote, supervisory committee, end quote, for checking and inspection. The management committee set up departments for different tasks. Agriculture, forestry, water control, livestock, fishery, industry, finance, trade, culture and education, armed defense, and the like. All these had force of government at township level. Members were to be paid, quote, according to work, end quote. A, quote, wage system, end quote, would be set up when the commune, quote, acquire stability of income, end quote. This would replace the system common under the cooperatives of paying by workdays, reckoned at harvest. The wage system made local industry possible, and began the transition from peasant life to the life of industrial workers. Far down, in Article 15, the Constitution mentioned the possibility of free grain to members, quote, when the grain supply reaches a higher level and all members of the commune agree, end quote. This free supply to everyone, including children and aged unable to work, was to be introduced only when the harvest was enough to do it, quote, while increasing and not decreasing the income of members supplying the labor power, end quote. The commune did not intend that any ultra-left voting by large, hungry families should introduce any free distribution that might discourage the actual laboring force. The commune was to organize the labor force in, quote, production brigades, end quote or working units, usually ranging from 100 to 150 able-bodied adults. And these were to be combined in what we may translate as, quote, production contingents, end quote, usually over 500 workers. Community canteens were to be organized, and also nurseries, kindergartens, and sewing teams, quote, to free the woman from household labor, end quote. These services were to be run at cost, quote, without losses or profits, end quote. In practice, with the bumper harvest that soon came, they were usually run without any charge at all. An important provision noted, quote, members need not use the canteen or nursery service if they do not want to, end quote. Other articles provided for, quote, universal compulsory education, end quote, for, quote, health and medical service on a cooperative basis, end quote, not necessarily free, for, quote, happy courts, end quote, for the aged and disabled, quote, who have nobody to depend on, end quote, which implied a system of old age relief, and certainly not, quote, splitting of the home, end quote. Other provisions were for financing and planning, reserves and expansion. The full daring and originality of this new organization becomes clear from careful study of the Constitution. The citizens of the local area, usually of township size, assumed ownership and management of all local natural resources, land, minerals, livestock, industries, subject only to normal taxes to the state. They were to manage these properties democratically and expand them, and take responsibility for caring for all children and disabled, 
for paying steadily increasing wages to all workers, for developing education and health services, roads, communications, irrigation works from their own resources and suitable to their needs. Any student of government or of economic forms can at once think of many problems which this type of organization will face. But the comment quickly made abroad that the communes were, quote, militarization by Beijing, end quote, seems singularly untrue. For no such decentralization of government, of economic assets and management, had ever been seen before. It was now being proposed in the most populous nation on earth, with 650 million people who had been mostly illiterate 10 years earlier and who are now being offered, in local organizations, the ownership and management of these local resources, with the responsibility of using these to develop not only food production, but industry, trade, education, and government, and all they desired of a good life. The peasants of China saw this new form as an unprecedented opportunity for rapid progress. The communists of China saw it as the basic cell in what would become the future communist society. But in the rest of the world, which, far more than China, is today disturbed by the threat of annihilating thermonuclear war, there must have been those who saw at once that the communes made China invulnerable far beyond other nations. Short of a war destroying the human race on the planet, a possibility in which the Chinese do not believe, what major harm can be done to a nation whose great central irrigation dams are supplemented by millions of small reservoirs in every township? whose central steel plants are reinforced by local iron and steel works in every county, whose citizens are organized to the ends of the land as mobile warriors, with every small unit able to raise food, make clothing and steel, and govern itself on a township basis. The strategic invulnerability which the People's Commune gives to China, as well as the great economic potential, possibly accounts for the virulence of the foreign attack. The Constitution of Sputnik Commune, adopted on August 7, was widely published, quote, as reference material, end quote. This gave prestige, but no authority, over any people, except its own members. The Communist Party of China had not yet spoken any authoritative word as to the Commune's detailed form. During August, the provincial party committees everywhere promoted experimental communes, encouraging sample, quote, enlarged cooperatives, end quote, to develop their own ideas. By the end of August, it was reported that all the peasants in Hunan and Liaoning provinces had joined the communes, and that on a national scale, 30% of all China's peasants had joined. Then, and then only, did the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party issue its first official resolution on the communes, on August 29, 1958. This resolution, the first official statement of nationwide policy, was a modest document of six pages, somewhat more conservative than the Sputnik Constitution. It stated that, quote, people's communes have made their appearance, end quote, that, quote, it is highly probable that there will soon be an upsurge, end quote, and that, because of the, quote, unprecedented advance in farming and the demands of rural industry for manpower, this new form has become the proper form to accelerate socialist construction and carry out the gradual transition to communism, end quote. The township is recommended as the normal size, but larger or smaller communes may appear through local conditions. Merges of local cooperatives should depend on local decision, and this, quote, should not be hastened, end quote. No changes of ownership should be pushed, quote, beyond the desires of the owners, end quote. All large, merged cooperatives should now be called, quote, people's communes, end quote. They should embrace not only farming, but also industry, trade, education, and military affairs at the lowest level. They should seek to introduce a wage system instead of the earlier, indefinite payment by shares of harvest. Payments were still, quote, on the basis of work done, end quote, and not, quote, according to needs, end quote. But in future, the communes are the best form, quote, for transition to communism, end quote, and will develop into, quote, basic units, end quote, of the future communist society. No mention was made in this short, restrained resolution of anything like, quote, free food, end quote. The Sputnik Constitution had mentioned, quote, grain supply, end quote, as a future possibility. The Communist Party's resolution did not go so far. 
But within a month, the communes, organizing across all China, were to raise the banner of, quote, free food, end quote, in a happy assertion that, to China's peasants, even wages were less important than the great dream that nobody in the area should be hungry. That famine of centuries was conquered at last. As one traces the history of the rise of the people's communes, one is struck by the constant presence of communist leadership, and yet by how little it takes the form of, quote, orders from Beijing, end quote. Communist leadership exists from the township to the nation's center. The local communists seek to organize the local people for the satisfaction of their demands for a better life. When they lead badly, as they did in 1957 in Changshu through apathy and in Hunan province through choice of a mistaken line, they are brought up short by actual failure, shown by small harvests and a poorer life. Mistakes of this kind provoke their own correction, and they may even introduce a new advance. Meantime, the Central Committee publicizes the successes in the press, studies the failures, and analyzes in what ways and forms the people's demands may best be achieved. A popular drive is encouraged. This goes as far and as fast as the people will take it, and gives birth to hundreds of new ideas and forms that at first are not restrained by criticism from above. Quote, The first requisite of a people's movement is that it shall move, end quote said a Beijing communist to me, quote, and premature comment might halt it, end quote. After a few weeks, it is clear that the people have chosen a direction, but that many details are disputed or tend to excess. Now is the time for analysis, criticism, the crystallizing of a form. Then the Central Committee speaks, fixing the new line in a formal resolution. It is significant that the line thus fixed does not go as far as the most advanced examples. It goes as far as the Central Committee judges the great mass of the people are ready to go. But it also indicates a future trend further than most advances have gone. This technique of leadership, deriving policy from the demands and actions of the people, analyzing them, and giving a clearer form and returning this to the people to encourage a greater drive, is what is called the, quote, mass line, end quote. The party resolution on communes of August 29 was passed after 30% of the peasants had joined the communes. It predicted, quote, an upsurge, end quote, and the upsurge quickly came. By September's end, 90% of the peasants were in communes, and many of them, excited by their bumper crop, were going far beyond the party resolution and declaring, quote, free food, end quote. Many of them were competing somewhat to excess of the number of free items they offered. Through October and November, they advanced in a dozen directions with a force of explosion, creating new industries, mines, forestry, fisheries, dining rooms, schools, houses, according to local demand. Not until 99% of the peasants were in communes, and two months' experience again began to show what methods were succeeding and which bore seeds of failure, would the Central Committee intervene again? Sleeping on the Hill With iron pick for pillow, and feet against a rock, with earth beneath for mattress, and sky my bed and quilt, the north wind woke me. But I turned over and said, Blow there, blow the moon down. You won't blow me off the hill till our dam is done. Shandong